let's begin the way that you usually do in an economics course, but it also makes sense. Uh, when we talk about what is money, uh, generally you'd be in with the functions. What can you do with money? Well, you can spend it. We call that medium of exchange in our economics classes. You can pay bills with it. We call that means of payment. And I've highlighted here, including your tax bill, because that is something that is very important for MMT. Probably most of you know uh, the punchline on that, which we will get to. Uh, you can save it, but you got to be careful. If you save too much, take it too far, then you're a Scrooge, which uh, is not a good thing to be. And finally, you can redeem it. This is another very important point that I'm going to be talking about as we move through this. Okay, but that doesn't really tell us what money is. It tells us what money does, not really what it is. It's sort of like saying a human is something that sits on the couch and munches potato chips while they watch TV. It doesn't really tell us what a human is. If you look at every form of money, uh, it is always an IOU. The currency, whether it's paper money or coins, is the IOU of Uncle Sam. Technically, it could be the Fed or it could be the Treasury, but it's a government IOU. When you write a check to your landlord, that is your promise to pay, which is an IOU. Now, your bank backs you up. They endorse the check and they are going to make the payment for you, but it is your IOU. People say uh, they've made a big deal about this, that, you know, in the future, we're going to have electronic money. Well, the truth is almost all of our money already is electronic. Almost all transactions are uh, electronic today. We may use currency very occasionally unless we happen to be in one of the illegal trades. And sometimes we write checks. Uh, younger people probably never write checks, don't even know what they are. And so the payments really are electronic already for the most part. We can ask, where did money come from? What are the origins of money? John Maynard Keynes, who is, I think, the greatest economist, at least in the non-Marxist tradition. Okay, so I will have that caveat. Uh, he said, well, the, you know, the origins are lost in the mists of time. And he goes on to say, it was at least 4,000 years ago that money was invented, and most likely in Babylonia. Uh, David Graeber has a great book on the history of debt, and we probably can push that back a bit further than what Keynes uh, thought. We have a lot more evidence now, uh, but probably it was Babylonia. Maybe it was more like 6,000 years ago. And it was created by accountants who were keeping records on clay Shubati tablets. And this is long before there were coins, long before paper money. Uh, in fact, long before there was currency. Uh, money first existed as uh, records kept on clay uh, that didn't really change hands. It was a form of record keeping. And purchases were mostly in the form of credit that then would be uh, eventually settled. So we like to think that we're much more advanced than the Babylonians. We have credits, uh, credit and debt now. But actually, that's probably the way that money began. And it's been very common for the past 6,000 years to buy things on credit. If you're buying stuff on credit, somebody's got to keep track. So we got to keep records of those debts and credits. So debts are denominated in a money of account. Now we are used to having measuring units and these are probably as old as humans. Uh, we have measurements for volume, uh, cups, milliliters. We have measurements for weight, pounds, kilograms. And we have measurements for uh, distance, length, uh, inches, feet, centimeters, and so on. And then we keep a record of those measurements. Now, money was a conceptual leap. It's pretty easy for a human to come up with, you know, the notion of an inch. I got an inch right here. I can measure things with this. I measure things that have the characteristic of length, or I measure things that have the characteristic of weight. But money is a strange measuring unit because we can measure things that have no obvious physical characteristic in common whatsoever. 
That was the leap that probably was made by Mesopotamians, okay? We can compare things that have nothing obvious in common using this measuring unit, money. And so I show here the alewife in Babylonian times who uh, makes the beer and sells the beer. And when you uh, drink a few beers, she records your debt on slate, chalk on slate behind the um, bar. And then uh, once a year, or it, sometimes it could go a couple of years, you would settle your debts that are denominated in mina, which was the money of account, by delivering barley, which she needs because she's going to make more beer. Okay, so this is what I meant by most transactions took the form of credits and debits. So what is money? Money is an IOU denominated in the money of account. Who can create money? My professor, Hyman Minsky, used to always say, anyone can create money. All you have to do is write IOU five bucks. You have created money. The problem is to get it accepted. You have to have somebody willing to accept your IOU denominated in the money of account. Um, I talked about uh, Babylonia. They use the clay Shabbat tablets. There's a picture here of those. In Europe, records were kept uh, mostly on tally sticks. Uh, as far back as we know, the records of money and indebtedness was recorded on sticks. Hazelwood tally sticks. We still use the word tally for tallying up your debts. And what they would do is notch across the stick and then split it in two so that you had a stock and a stub. So you have a record that can be matched to make sure you have not counterfeited by putting more notches on the stick. And then finally, the thicker notches were called scores, which we still use today as in um, a baseball score, which I'll come back to. We also have the term raise a tally uh, when the king wants to spend, which I'll come back to. Okay, there is a very uh, a universal principle of debt, and that is that it must be redeemed. So let me uh, give, this is actually Eric Tamoyne's example that I borrowed and that Heskey has drawn up, uh, Joe's Pizza Joint. So he starts up a, a pizza joint and he wants to drum up some business. So he passes free pizza coupons around the neighborhood. That pizza coupon is Joe's debt. If you get one of these pizza coupons, it is your asset, Okay. Now, what does Joe owe you? This is not a money debt, it's a pizza debt. He owes you a pizza. You bring the coupon in, Joe cooks the pizza, and you present your coupon. You have redeemed the coupon, and Joe has redeemed his debt. There's a simultaneous redemption. Both parties are redeemed. Joe no longer owes you a pizza, uh, and you no longer have Joe's debt. Now, what does Joe do with the pizza coupon? Well, he tosses it in the pizza oven because for him, it's just a piece of paper. It used to be his debt, but now it's been redeemed. He no longer owes a pizza. And so he's just going to burn that coupon. Let me give you another example. This comes from Farley Grubb, who's one of the top experts on colonial American money. What he found is if you look at the 13 colonies, all of them issued paper money. Very unusual. This was the first example of paper money issue in the West. Chinese had, had paper money for hundreds of years before, but in the West, we did not have that. The American colonies could not issue coins. They had to use British coins. They were prohibited from issuing their own coins, and they were always short of coins to fund the American colonial expenses. And so they hit on the idea of paper money because it was sort of a loophole in the law. There was no law that said you can't create paper money because no one had thought of doing that before. So each uh, legislature, so let's just take the example of uh, Virginia, would authorize the printing and issuing of, say, 10,000 pounds of Virginia notes. And at the same time, they would impose a new tax that was expected to raise 10,000 pounds over the next several years. They would then spend those paper notes into existence. 
uh, you would sell your mule and cart to the colonial government and receive back paper money. Now, why on earth would you trade your mule, which has obvious value, for a piece of paper that says 50 shillings? And the answer is, well, you had to pay the tax. Once you pay the tax, it returns to the colonial government. That is redemption. There's a simultaneous redemption, just like with Joe's pizza coupon. You no longer owe a tax debt, and the government no longer owes you in the form of the paper promise. Okay? What does the government do with the paper money? Just like Joe, they burn it. And this is fact. <laughs> So the colonial governments kept very careful records of uh, all the taxes received, and they wanted to demonstrate that all of those paper notes were burned. They were taken out of circulation and burned when the taxes were paid. 